All right, everyone, hello, and uh, uh, good morning, afternoon, or evening, depending on, on when you're, you're joining us from. Um, again, thank you very much for, for connecting. Today, we're going to hold a, yet another one of uh, Finboot's thought leadership events. Uh, this one in particular, we, we think it marks a bit of a special occasion as uh, we started this uh, a year ago in January 2020 with an in-person event in collaboration with Repsol, which we held at their technology center near Madrid. Uh, the pandemic and those associated restrictions kind of forced us to take this different approach, but it turned out to be a great opportunity to kind of take these events into a much more global audience, right? Uh, before we begin, I just want to give you a little bit of background on, on Finboot, who is, uh, let's say, the organization putting these, uh, these sessions together. Finboot is an enterprise software company that focuses on accelerating the delivery of digital technologies for, for enterprise ecosystems. Uh, we've created a blockchain middleware, which we call uh, Marco. Uh, that kind of simplifies the technology for the enterprise user and, and makes it, let's say, possible to adopt and scale these digital solutions in, in what have been traditionally lowly digitized ecosystems. Some of our customers include uh, the oil and energy giant uh, Repsol, uh, the uh, chemical company Stahl, and the leading international fashion brand uh, Desigual. Uh, on today's session, as, as you know, we're, we're going to be kind of focusing on how digital can drive the ESG agenda. I have the great pleasure uh, to introduce you to, to Geoffrey Kahn, who's going to help us navigate sort of uh, those interactions or those, or those dynamics between ESG and, and digital. We, uh, we welcome your, your questions throughout, throughout the session, whether that is through the Q&A uh, or the, the Q&A or the, or the chat uh, sort of feature of, of Zoom. And, and we'll make sure that we leave some time towards the end to, to cover as, as many of those as, as, we can, as we can possibly cover, right? But uh, again, thank you. And Geoffrey, with that, I'll, I'll leave it to you to, to begin the masterclass. <clears throat> uh, well, uh, Juan uh, and everyone, thank you very much for taking time out today. Uh, to take in this masterclass uh, discussion on how digital and ESG uh, relate to each other. And um, now by way of, of uh, personal introduction, um, my name is Jeffrey Can, and I'm an author, a professional speaker, and an instructor on the topic of digital innovation, uh, specifically in oil and gas. But of course, uh, these days that encompasses a much broader energy uh, uh, world. In 2019, I published my first book, which is uh, uh, just up here, uh, called Bits, Bytes, and Barrels, The Digital Transformation of Oil and Gas. And that was after a 30-year career as a management consultant. Uh, you can find me by uh, just typing in my name uh, uh, into whatever search engine you're using, or if you wish to see and check out my podcast uh, or live stream service on YouTube or whatever, just uh, look for Digital Oil and Gas. Now, if you are raising uh, money in capital markets today, you're gonna to be asked two questions. Number one, what is your commitment to ESG? And number two, how are you dealing with technology-driven change? Now, of course, these are separate questions and you're gonna need clear answers for them. But I think you should prepare to try and answer a third question, which is, how are you leveraging digital innovations to meet your ESG objectives? This is what I call the sweet spot, the overlap. Let's begin with the energy industry question. I focus on the uh, in energy industry because many years ago when I was young and quite impressionable, I was traveling in China and I took photographs of donkey carts delivering coal door to door in China. And that clinched it for me. Talk about an opportunity. Imagine moving a billion people off of an addiction to fuel delivery by donkey. I mean, what could possibly go wrong? I personally don't take credit for it, but fossil fuels are now pretty much uh, instrumental to our world 
and our way of life. And I can tell you, China, for sure, is not going back to donkey carts anytime soon. For my sins, I've worked in uh, pipelines, oil refineries, oil ports, LNG facilities, upstream, downstream, regulators, trade and retailing, pretty much the whole length of the value chain in countries as varied as Canada, the United States, South Korea, Japan, the Caribbean, uh, China, of course, Hong Kong, Australia, and, and many other places. In addition to energy, I've also worked in cement manufacturing, auto manufacturing, the public sector, utilities, uh, logistics, supply chain. My kids once said to me, they're pretty sure I have some sort of industrial attention deficit disorder where I can't concentrate on any one thing for very long, which I, I flat out disagree with. But one thing I learned was that the challenges that all of these sectors are facing now are pretty much the same. And companies in this industry are facing the exact same questions. Number one, what is your commitment to ESG? And number two, what are you doing to cope with technology-driven change? But what exactly is ESG? Well, many people wonder what it stands for. In my case, I originally thought it was some sort of three-syllable drug like aspirin or Tylenol or Viagra. But then during the pandemic, I learned about something called hydroxychloroquine and so much for that. The E stands for environmental, S stands for society, and G is for governance. The concept here is that companies will take into account these, these broader ESG dimensions in their decision-making so that they consider broader criteria than just a profit motive. Environmental uh, includes the energy consumed and the waste produced and the effects that that has on all living things, plants, animals, birds, fish, our water resources, ocean, soil, land, whatever. It includes impacts that are both uh, absolute in the moment as well as cumulative, the overall balance, the ability of our natural systems to recover and repair and rejuvenate themselves. These are all factors that are taken into account in the environmental considerations. Society considerations include the relationships and the reputation of our enterprises. And that includes relationships with people, labor, indigenous communities, populations, both rural and urban, the disadvantaged and developing nations. And governance, the final, the G, is the system of practice, controls, and procedures that you use to take decisions to comply with the law and to meet the needs of regulators, capital, youth, students, and others. ESG thinking has come about because traditionally, the production and consumption decisions that enterprises, uh, nations, even individuals uh, make typically place a priority on what I call short-term and very narrow criteria, such as getting the lowest price or maximizing the profit or hitting an earning target or satisfying a regulator and not on these broader longer stride factors. I now believe that digital innovations are one of the very few tools available to industry, including both energy producers and consumers, to lower their costs and improve their productivity and meet those ESG objectives. And I'm, I'm not alone in this thinking. The IEA first hinted at this possibility in their seminal study of 2017 on the impact of digital uh, on the energy sector, where they noted that digital could certainly help to lower carbon emissions. But ESG, as I've just shown, is much more than just carbon abatement. It's uh, uh, much, much more. The next generation of talent, the millennial generation, really get this. Millennials today stand at the very threshold of their peak earning years, and they maintain a very, very strong belief that the companies in which they invest have to go beyond just money-making and to be part of the solution. In a global survey conducted last year by the DeVere Group, fully 77% of millennial investors said that the environmental, social, and governance issues aren't just a priority, it's their top priority when assessing their investment opportunities. Millennials are far more likely 
to want to work for companies that make strong ESG commitments. A 2019 survey by the DeVere Group, or sorry, by the GNA Institute, showed that 40% of millennials were prepared to take a pay cut to work for a responsible company. And 40% of millennials had already made an employment decision using responsible criteria as part of their employment choice. Compare this to just 17% of baby boomers who make the same kind of decision choice. You have to remember the millennial generation experienced 9-11 as children, the 2008 recession, the slow starts to their careers, very high housing cost, high education cost, and they'd been immersed in technology from birth. Now, me, in my case, I, I grew up with um, Sony Walkman, um, Pong on television sets. I, in fact, I remember when color TV was first introduced. Uh, I, I had the yellow pages. My world is very, very different. I'm now the man in that saying called stick it to the man. ESG is a response to people like me and the decisions that we grew up and were taught how to take. So our world is now very changed. It's now very, very different. It's hard to get uh, ESG right, specifically in the energy sector, because these elements are all very much uh, inter intertwined with each other. Let me tell you a story about how I was my first exposure. Several years ago, I was invited to Vancouver uh, to meet with five local indigenous tribes. There was a proposal at the time to build an expanded oil terminal in Vancouver Harbor, which is their traditional territory. And this was a subject over which I had some special expertise because I had actually worked for the Port Authority. The tribal leaders took to the podium for a few minutes at the start of our meeting to, for, for their opening remarks. And unfailingly, they called out their reverence for Mother Earth, their reliance on the natural habitat for food, sustenance, fishing, and furs, and their roles as the traditional stewards of the land. They decried pollution, a loss of habitat for hunting and fishing, <clears throat> and most concerned about the potential for an oil spill and what that would do to salmon stocks. One leader even stated, and I'm quoting, under no circumstances will a pipeline ever be built in our sacred waters. I remember leaning over to the lawyer beside me and I said, why are we even here? Well, at the break, I found out why. Each tribal leader took us aside quietly away from the others and had an entirely different conversation. Can young people find jobs in a pipeline? How do we, how do we invest in a pipeline? Can we actually own the pipeline? How is the decision taken to invest in a pipeline? Uh, do pipelines even make money? Are there jobs in construction and operations? You can see the dilemma facing the Aboriginal communities, ESG issues. They talked about the crisis of unemployment on their tribal lands, the anguish of substance abuse, their desire to break away from the bonds of poverty. But they also knew they were completely reliant on gasoline for their snow machines, for their chainsaws, for their fishing, for their, for their energy and their heat, their, their mobility. That's why we were having the meeting to help them reconcile conflicts within their own community, reconciling their own conflicting goals around ESG. Capital markets are now very worried um, about activist investors and youthful money, the millennials. They know and have taken note of the rise of ESG, and now they're exerting very real pressure on many industries, including energy, chemicals, resources in particular, to declare clear goals and intentions with respect to the environment, society, and governance. Without that clarity, construction projects can no longer secure insurance so that they can be built. And the production of oil and gas will simply not get funding. As recently as December 5th of last year, The Economist published an article about how even mighty Alberta this is uh, the, the energy industry of, on the planet that is easily the most highly regulated. 
It's the biggest Canadian investor in clean tech and renewable energy. And it's his undisputed export engine of the entire Canadian economy. And has been completely brought to heel because of Wall Street money and environmental concerns about the future, particularly in the US. One way to see how capital markets view energy companies is through the market indices. Now, these are not perfect because indices are a measure of other things besides uh, ESG metrics, but they provide a very interesting and useful guide to how um, the market is being sensitive uh, to these sectors. For example, uh, this is research just from this week. The S&P TSX index for uh, oil is down 26% over the last year. Meanwhile, the S&P TSX index for clean tech and renewables is up 80%. The market is clearly shifting. The former governor of the Bank of Canada, Mark Carney, has been sounding the alarm about uh, the fossil fuel sector for several years, that it is at risk of stranding as much as 50% of its subsurface resource. That 50% in oil terms is around 500 billion barrels of oil. It's worth $22 trillion. It's an enormous, enormously valuable resource. So in response, businesses throughout the energy industry now have to take very serious and binding commitments with respect to their ESG um, goals to serve to both change, uh, change their behavior, access capital to develop those resources, secure the resource they already have invested in and avoid stranding it underground, lower their exposure to all manner of looming risks, polish their brands so that they are viewed as credible community participants, and finally, to attract talent who have, have clearly said, unless you are a responsible company, we, won't, we don't want to join you. This brings us, of course, to the third element, digital. And the question, how are you dealing with technology-driven change? For the past two years, I've been writing, speaking, and teaching about the impacts of digital on the oil and gas industry. In my book in 2019, I wrote about 12 case studies of digital innovation throughout oil and gas that were the earliest examples of new business models, dramatic cost and productivity gains, and the impact on reserves and resources. I did not link digital at the time in my book to ESG values. And I can tell you today, if I were to rewrite the book, I would devote considerably more attention to this very important topic. But I did note in the book how capital markets in the space of just 15 years had fundamentally shifted their valuations to favor data rich, asset light, fast iteration, digital businesses. Digital companies today now command trillion dollar valuations. The digital sector features dozens of unicorn companies, uh, companies that are valued at a billion dollars or more. And the leaders of these companies are shockingly youthful. This was a real talent draw. Although I'm pretty sure young people don't work for Facebook just because Mark Zuckerberg is so handsome. The energy industry, still king from a revenue and income cash flow standpoint, is being left behind. In 2002, the largest companies by, in the world by market capitaliz uh, capitalization were led by Microsoft, then Exxon, an energy company, followed by GE, Walmart, and Pfizer, a pharmaceutical uh, giant. The, that's by market cap, the largest companies by revenue in 2002. Uh, were Walmart, big retailer, GE, sorry, ExxonMobil, then GE, then BP, another oil company, and Ford. That's 2002. Fast forward to 2019. By then, the largest companies in the world by market capitalization are all digital. Microsoft, Amazon, Alphabet, Apple, Facebook, Tencent, Alibaba. 
the largest companies by revenue still generating pots of cash are now headed up by Walmart again, but the next four are all energy concerns. Sinopec, Chinese uh, national oil company, uh, Shell, National Petroleum Company of China, and State Grid, another Chinese energy giant. And in case you think these capital shifts are only a concern for energy companies, you need to think again. Tesla's stock is up 800% in 2020. Tesla is the muscular offspring of an ESG mother and a digital father. GM and Ford shares are up 50%. BMW and Volkswagen flat. Daimler up 20%. The market is voting in favor of these ESG and digital businesses. It's now a meme to point out that COVID has had more transformational impact on industry than CEOs, boards, and CFOs. And that is accurate. Although COVID, in my view, has been an accelerant on a fire that was already burning. And speaking of fires, there were some real forest fires in Canada's oil district back in 2016. Imperial Oil at the time became quite alarmed and decided to move one of their critical control centers from the uh, far uh, northern forest district where the oil was down to the relative safety of the office towers in Calgary, some um, several hundred kilometers distance. This, at the time, was um, heretical thinking. Control rooms have always and only been on site. And this project meandered its way through approval cycles and reviews and assessments and trials and tests, and then the pandemic hit. And then the control room was moved in three weeks. A real accelerant. And these kinds of changes, you know, once they're in place, they're permanent. They're, there's no returning, there's no going back. And the uncertainties of this pandemic, the vaccination programs means that more changes from digital are, are coming to this industry. Remember, the energy industry is amongst the slowest of all industries <clears throat> to embrace change. Now, this is a tough message to hear, but frankly, the industry is just getting started on its use of digital tools. It's still really early innings in the pace by which these tools are being adopted. By my estimate, 85% thereabouts of all oil and gas plant and equipment on the planet, from wellheads to pipelines to real retail stations, all predate the internet era, let alone digital. We got a long ways to go. And of course that brings us back to here, to the center, to where ESG, digital and energy all meet and to the question of the session. How can digital support your ESG agenda? Well, with industries facing such huge headwinds, I use the example, of course, our global recession, in the case of, of oil and gas, certainly very, very little capital available to do anything. Funding a transformation of the business to align fully with all possible ESG dimensions is, pra is pretty much impractical. ESG management is going to be about making some hard choices and some trade-offs. McKinsey says that if you think about the um, uh, think about uh, the impact that uh, 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 digital will have on or uh, the, the economic drivers of your ESG proposition. Uh, there are five dominant effects. Number one, the first is to drive growth. You can either through your ESG program attract customers uh, such as the millennials to invest or to work for you, or you can drive access to resources because your company or your enterprise is more respectful of the impacts of your operations on the environment. Of course, the converse is also true. If you are not driving your ESG agenda effectively, you run the risk of turning off customers, chasing them away, or being denied access uh, to resources. Those resources could be land, water, 
uh, uh, infrastructure. Next factor is to reduce cost. Either because you have lowered the per unit energy cost going into your operation, or you've changed the, the amount of uh, energy, the type of energy you're consuming, so substituting um, a different energy for fossil fuels, or you've lowered your water use. And of course, the converse is true. Uh, higher energy use per unit or a higher cost of energy uh, through emissions taxes will inflate your costs. Third factor is beneficial regulatory and legal advantages. These include things like giving you more strategic freedom, um, the uh, access to government subsidies perhaps, or for uh, community support programs. And the converse we can absolutely see playing out with the social gi media giants today, where they're being charged with um, uh, being a monopolist, threats of being broken up, uh, demands that they pay higher taxes and the like. The fourth factor, according to McKinsey, is the ability to boost your productivity. This comes from a more engaged workforce. Again, back to that millennial, millennial effect and of course, talent attraction. And number five is asset optimization. Superior capital allocation so that you can allocate your capital to the very, very best prospects and avoid stranding your assets. So beyond the bare minimum um, of compliance to these existing regulations, here are a handful of candidate areas for digital investment to improve your ESG position. Number one, brownfield analytics. As I mentioned, the majority of industrial infrastructure from power plants to wells to gas plants predate ESG concerns and the digital era. These assets, they're now a drag on companies' abilities to achieve much progress with an ESG agenda because they're so resistant to change. On the other hand, they can be data-rich assets because many of them are connected to controlling systems like SCADA and other monitoring technologies. Where digital can really help is by boosting the analytic possibilities based on that data through machine learning and artificial intelligence. These tools can help improve the quality of that legacy data so that you can use it to yield a better analytic outcome, as well as by just conducting better analytics in the moment. Better analytics leads to better operations decisions, which can be tied to your ESG goals. In time, and it will take time, brownfield assets can then be managed more tightly and in conformance with your ESG objectives such as energy use and waste. Number two, carbon tracking and tracing. Brownfield assets are gonna be carbon sources uh, for the foreseeable future because it's hard to change their fuel inputs and consumption uh, characteristics. What this means that industry is going to have to carefully track its carbon position so that you can take the appropriate offsets. Getting to net zero means an explicit acknowledgement. You're gonna be positive in some respects and negative on the other. So you need to get very, very sharp on where you're positive so that you invest appropriately to reduce your carbon position. Today, carbon emissions, carbon measurements tend to be from engineering first principles a specific asset with a specific configuration with a specific fuel source is going to have a specific measure, um, uh, engineeringly measured, engineering measured um, out, output of either uh, energy waste, CO2 or water. The problem though, is that assets leak and valves decalibrate. And as a result of scale effects, minor variances in carbon measurement can absolutely add up to huge differences uh, from what your engineering estimates were. This plays out in, and, and you see these stories frequently in the media about how uh, gas wells in parts of the United States produce much more methane than they first uh, engineers thought. Digital tools can help by providing better monitoring of actual asset carbon impacts by detecting real vapors and recording that measurement data with very, very low latency in easy to access cloud databases. Simple cameras now, like the, the kind of camera for this web, uh, web uh, webinar 
Simple cameras like this are now very good at measuring and detecting vapors uh, in, uh, in the air. And new satellite imagery from the new satellite technologies coming, uh, boosted by artificial intelligence, will really help us uh, measure true and accurate uh, carbon effects. A company called Asperity provides uh, camera uh, da data management and, and uh, data uh, detection of vapors for some of Shell's assets. Some US states cap oil production because of emissions targets. But if you could capture those emissions, either through uh, carbon capture or incinerate them before they become uh, emissions uh, in the air, and then track that using uh, blockchain structures, regulators uh, can allow producers to run those assets hotter and produce more, improving the yield from those assets, a productivity boost. This is the example of, of um, where McKinsey's analysis, improving productivity and applying a digital tool improves the um, productivity of an asset. Number three, optimization of movement. Optimization of work is hard. Imagine this, you're running a, a tank farm and the, you have hundreds of tanks. There are varying sizes and capacities. They're constantly changing customer demand of what's flowing into the tanks and what's being purchased, what's being taken out. You have real limits on pipe capacities and, and uh, pipe uh, flow rates, pumps. And, um, and then of course you have fluctuating power prices and you need power to run the pumps. Today, you may be able to optimize for rateability, but what if you wanted to manage to some other factor, such as uh, lowest carbon emissions, just so that you take advantage of uh, green energy, uh, should it be available? It turns out this is a really hard problem to solve. Most tank farms are uh, run by rules of thumb. Uh, they're changing constantly. They have relatively simple algorithms uh, behind them, and the management of them is often done using Excel spreadsheets. Market leaders now use uh, the immense processing capacity of cloud computing and really clever modeling tools from companies like Stream Systems to calculate these optimization possibilities. This optimization problem of moving things from place to place is everywhere in our society. This includes the movement of shipping containers, the loading and unloading of Amazon's delivery vehicles, to crewing workers to work on an, air, uh, on an aircraft. It's, uh, this, uh, this physical movement and alignment of, of those resources through our, these supply structures, this optimization problem, it's now solvable with digital. And that will unlock ESG uh, performance. Number four, asset automation. In the upstream of oil and gas, uh, the, the wells are subject to the Pareto principle. Let me cast your mind back to several years you will have heard about the Pareto principle. And it says that there's an 80, it's the 80-20 rule. 80% 80 of oil is produced out of 20% of the wells. But the converse is also true. 80% of the wells produce just 20% of the oil. In other words, a piddling amount. These tiny wells, and there's hundreds of thousands of them, cannot sustain the cost of a dedicated crew of petroleum engineers and highly compensated professional oil uh, people to uh, constantly track uh, these and optimize these assets at, 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 uh, on, a, on a continuous basis. In addition, it turns out, if you build a, a pad with more than one well on it, which is now quite customary in, in Canada and the United States, the wells are interconnected to each other somehow underground so that the decisions you might take on one well have a spillover effect on other wells in the same area. By strapping inexpensive sensors to these wells and feeding the data collected into an artificial intelligence engine, in this case, one called Kelvin, um, BP has cut its field costs in, in the fields where it's using this technology by 22%. And it's improved the productivity of those wells by a further 20%. So a 20% cost reduction and a 20% productivity boost. Mobilizing people to maintain and repair those wells incurs a carbon cost. So there's an avoidance of carbon 
uh, emissions. But here's the kicker, the big ESG angle. Methane venting is down 74% in those, in the, for these wells, 74%. That's the big ESG story. Clearly, if you can measure it, you can manage it. Next is supply chain transparency. In our global world now, the supply chains for many products, oil, gas, chemicals, food, these supply chains are now very long and they're very complex. Tracing products through the supply chain to provide the assurance that those products were sourced from an ethical uh, point with, uh, from a supplier with meaningful ESG practices, who is not contributing to waste um, emissions and is disposing of the products in a safe and responsible manner uh, through, through meaningful ESG practices is fast becoming a requirement if you wish to supply global brands. This is already very pronounced in consumer goods, pharmaceuticals, food products, and it has now come to the chemicals industry. In my lifetime, I didn't think I would see this, but it is here. Finboot, who are sponsoring the webinar this morning, are a supplier of middleware blockchain technologies. And uh, this, these technologies are being used to help chemical producers track and trace their products, fluids, and gases, and commodities throughout the full supply chain. And given the supply chain's high level of fragmentation, multiple handoffs, discrete services, frequent changes of control and ownership, high regulatory burden, this is a hard problem to solve. Market leaders like Stahl Chemicals are using these tools uh, to deliver the transparency that supply chain participants need so that they can continue to supply these global brands and be able to demonstrate meaningful progress on their ESG metrics. So how do you move forward? Well, I recommend taking a page from a book entitled 10 Types of Innovation. It's written by Larry Keeley. And Larry, in partnership with another uh, researcher named Jay Doblin, have been studying the world of innovation for the better part of three decades. They also tried to understand not only how innovation worked, but equally importantly, why it failed. First recommendation, organize yourself for success. Most likely, your organization has set up a digital center of excellence or an innovation council, or maybe a SWAT team or a strike force in digital. You've probably set up an ESG team, or at a minimum, you will have handed some ESG responsibilities off to <clears throat> specific expertise. Big energy companies <clears throat> frequently have someone who is focused exclusively on uh, indigenous and Aboriginal people relationships. <clears throat> Why not assign a person from your ESG team to connect regularly with your digital leaders comp to compare notes, um, to explore for fresh opportunities and to highlight critical wins. Chances are very, very good that some of your digital activity is already accretive to your ESG agenda. Next is to provide adequate resourcing. Let's face it, money talks. Nothing important in enterprise happens without money. Why not set aside a portion of your ESG funding, which would you would then aim explicitly at digital solutions? Or the other, the reverse, direct a portion of your digital funding to explore specific ESG opportunities and goals. Your organization is bound to be able to figure out where the opportunity is greatest. Third, set targets and metrics. Nothing, nothing motivates change more than having a specific goal to hit. It's not an accident that Shell now directly links managers' pay to hitting ESG targets. Why not incorporate a measure, an ESG measure, into your performance system that ties ESG and digital together, such as the number of your ESG initiatives that have some sort of uh, digital component or overlay? Why not require that every manager say with a budget in excess of pick a number, $2 million to spend on improvements, be required to spend some portion of that 
on digital ESG. And then why not create a scorecard of your ESG gains, such as reduction in water usage or land footprint, and then use digital tools to collect the data for the scorecard. Number four is to adapt your ways of working. Why not bring your digital team and your ESG team together for the occasional meetup? Train your digital team so that they at least understand explicitly what your ESG goals and objectives are in your annual ESG plan so that they can be sensitive to it. And similarly, why not expose your ESG professionals to digital innovations so that they can begin to power uh, ESG projects with digital uh, and that they can support their, their teams, their ESG teams to propose uh, how digital uh, can amplify their efforts. In oil and gas, we have a common practice called the safety moment. Why not change up the safety moment to have an ESG moment or a digital moment or a digital ESG moment? That, that helps bring and reinforces the importance of these messages uh, to the troops. You could feature your inside your company's internal communications. That's your portal or company newsletters where you reach out to all, all your employees in, in uh, broadcast uh, to discuss the field trials you're doing that accelerate your progress and highlight your wins. These four steps will serve you very, very well. So let me close here with the following observation. The next time you're asked, what is your commitment to ESG? And how are you dealing with technology-driven change? You should counter with how you are leveraging digital investments to meet your ESG objectives. You will surprise and delight your stakeholders, your investors, and talent. I'd like to thank you again for taking the time uh, to uh, take in this presentation. And I think at this point, we will open up the uh, chat line and uh, for questions or Q&A. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Jeffrey, very much for that very interesting uh, session, for the very interesting talk. We already have a couple of questions uh, queued in that uh, some of the attendees have sent throughout the session. But, but yeah, if anyone else uh, wants to submit another one, uh, please uh, be, you're, you're more than welcome to do so. Uh, so Jeffrey, the first question uh, they were asking, uh, I'm wondering if you can comment on whether industrial, not retail tech, companies are beginning to procure and develop systems to measure their scope two and scope three environmental impacts. So uh, scope two, yes. Uh, scope three, uh, there, there will likely be some out, in the, out on the very um, uh, for, uh, forefront who are. Uh, there was an announcement just this week, a company called Enervis uh, in the US as an example, who have released an ESG analytics platform. Uh, so, uh, and this takes into account data from all kinds of different sources, satellite imagery to provide full third party data about your the company's ESG footprints. Uh, so, uh, and it's being done yeah, for industrial companies. So uh, short answer is that not only are the technologies there, but there's clear demand for this, uh, given that, um, that uh, re uh, organizations are now stepping up to provide the, the analytic tools to be able to do that, that, that measurement. Uh, so yes, it's definitely, uh, definitely coming. All right, we have another, another question, which is, are you seeing an unintended negative consequence where companies with healthy balance sheets are selling the difficult to improve brownfield assets to show net improvements in their ESG portfolios versus putting resources into digitalization and environmental management? Yeah, there's no, there's no doubt about it that, um, uh, and this is a common practice in the oil and gas industry, by the way, that uh, once a given asset with a certain production level, uh, the engineering teams will try and figure out whether they can improve the, perf the economic performance of that asset. And if they, un if they cannot see how they can get the economic performance of that asset to hit the com internal company targets, that asset is going to be, sh is going to be sh sold or shut down or abandoned. Uh, so that's a that's a common practice, and given the yield curve uh, in oil and gas, every year is uh, the the pr productive capacity of wells goes down by on average globally six percent. Uh, the the uh, it doesn't take too long. Three years in, your your asset is producing twenty percent less than when you first started with it. 
Um, and um, and so, so the industry is constantly staring at how does it keep that yield curve up? And once it reaches the, that sort of point where there is no further uh, prospect, then the, the asset is going to be sold. I don't necessarily view this as a negative consequence. I believe because the pattern I've seen in the industry is that those brownfield assets, which can't attract capital in a, in a large portfolio of assets with say a super major, get bundled up and sold to small companies who can then invest at a lower cost to try and, and improve the productivity of those assets. And so this constant portfolio reshuffling and renewal is very, very standard in the industry. Uh, so I'm not sure I call it a negative. It's just a it's just a standard practice. And uh, but the short answer to the question is yes. The the, the bat portfolios are going to be trimmed constantly, and and ESG is going to be a new lens on which those the the portfolio will be measured. And I guess just to to add a comment on that, I suppose that yes, it is true that they might be sort of dropping or selling, moving away from some of those brownfield uh, assets, uh, but. Uh, it will also kind of add to the positive of their strategy that some of their new assets or some of their new sort of market opportunities are focused on digitally enabled and sustainable approaches, right? That, that basically everything new has this alignment. Yes, there's no question. If you have the option in a um, uh, in to to uh, in as your capital recycles to it put a um, a proper a fulsome ESG layer onto a greenfield asset design, uh, uh, that is it means that asset is going to hit these newer newer targets. I would I would go one step further than that. I would say uh, if you. If you took an asset pitch to uh, investors uh, for a greenfield play and you did not have a killer ESG story to talk about it, uh, the, the asset's not going to get funded. Uh, the the, the uh, investors will say, this asset is at risk of being stranded. And if the regulations uh, tighten up further, recarbon, water, land use, doesn't matter. Uh, if your asset's not nimble enough to respond to that or it has anticipated it has to be getting to ne near zero on these targets, it just simply won't get funding. So that's, the, that's, the, that's the, the structure that we're now in, whether we like it or not. All right, we've got uh, another question here that reads, uh, how can companies navigate the disjunctive of ESG and digital strategies with traditional company culture? Um, so just give me a moment while I look up the word disjunctive. <laughs> I don't know what that word means. <laughs> and I write books. Uh, so <laughs> this is a bit of a concern for me. Uh, okay. Is there another question while I look that up? Sure, sure, sure. I think it's because uh, I think it comes from Latin. Uh, we have something similar in Spanish. So it's, uh, I think, the disconnection or the misalignment, perhaps. Oh, oh misalignment. But, oh, yeah, yeah that's uh, OK. I get that. So um, so the question is, how do we how do we uh, cope with that? Yes, this is a uh, yeah. This is um, uh, um, anonymous. Whoever put this uh, this question in, uh, you have hit, have hit the absolute tip of the nail with with this question. What I highlight in my research on uh, with the oil and gas industry is that uh, digital is actually a cultural phenomenon. Uh, it's not a technology phenomenon, although we see it's it, it, we experience it through technology. But if you're sitting inside oil and gas, this is a culture challenge. How do you change the culture of your organization so that it uh, can take, take this uh, change into account? And it doesn't matter whether it's digital or ESG, it's, uh, it's a cultural issue. And um, I, uh, the, the short answer, I, I don't know that there is an answer uh, other than uh, it, it takes hard work. It's got to be absolutely led from the top. So this is a CEO responsibility to take this task on, to reframe and reshape the culture. And, uh, and it is relentless and unforgiving. You, it's, you cannot, it's not a flavor of the day. This is something that you need to think about as a true journey. And it will take, it will take time to unfold. But um, but it is there's no doubt the, the cultural problem people problem is the is the is the problem to solve here. Yeah, I guess we uh, so for, from our side at Finboot we we kind of run into this uh, more often than not in those yeah. relationships with our customers where you see there is a clear strategy to go digital there is a clear strategy to go towards more sustainable business activities but then we have to make sure that kind of that message got also 
there's like a bit of a waterfall effect, right? Where that goes or penetrates throughout the entire company, uh, which will eventually be the users of these uh, digital solutions. Uh, we have one, one final question. I don't know, we got two more questions, so we'll try to get through this uh, in time. Uh, yeah. So Alvaro asks, uh, do you think that digital projects in ESG should be implemented implement a starting from a small project and scaling based on the results of KPIs? Uh, well, I believe that uh, digital projects in general should follow the uh, digital and agile ways of uh, e evolution and adoption, which means that uh, they should um, start small so that they can evolve and adapt uh, very, very quickly. So uh, if I were bundling digital with ESG together to create something that's quite specific, that's exactly how I would tackle it. Um, now that uh, that should always be done in the context of a bigger vision. So the the, the phrasing I like to use is is think big, start small, move fast, and uh, the that equally applies to this question of digital in and ESG together. All right, and we've got one one final question is from from Amit, which I think links a little bit to the comments on culture that we have. Do you have any ideas to share regarding incentivizing the energy sector to adopt digital? Even if digital technologies pay for themselves, the, indus the industry is not excited to adopt anything new. Um, yeah, and so that's, there's, uh, there's, um, there's some truth to this, um, but at the same time, there is um, some myth to this. Uh, the, uh, if you look at um, uh, digital uh, investment in oil and gas in the pandemic, uh, the, this industry has moved um, uh, 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 still very, very quickly with embracing the digital projects that were underway. Uh, for instance, um, uh, TC Energy, I just interviewed um, a week ago for uh, uh, my podcast. And uh, TC Energy, just before the start of the pandemic, had kicked off a, a new project with um, a digital cloud-based planning tool called Anaplan. And the pandemic hit, everybody went home, but the company said, you know what? We're gonna keep on going. We, we, we are, we, we're not gonna get out of this pandemic work from home situation. Let's attempt a rollout of our technology, even though uh, people are not actually in the office. They kept right on going. Uh, most of the digital companies I deal with or talk to on a regular basis are not experiencing a slowdown in demand for innovation and change in oil and gas, it turns out. The traditional projects that are struggling uh, to get capital, uh, our new plant, new asset infrastructure, uh, and, uh, expansions and debottlenecking exercises, anything that requires an extensive legacy permitting and engineering works are really, really struggling. But digital innovation, innovations are actually doing quite well. And it's because uh, digital does not require um, cement and steel and, and significant, uh, significant uh, investments in that regard. So, um, so it is true there is a shortage of capital, but at the same time, that money is being spent uh, on, on um, innovation and digital, as it turns out. All right. Well, Geoffrey, thank you. Uh, thank you once more for this, uh, for this session. And thank you, everyone, for, uh, for joining us today. Uh, we will be sharing with everyone uh, the recording of the session, just if you want to kind of refresh on some of the topics that we touched on today. And, and we'll surely post as well some of the highlights of the session on a, on a sort of easier to consume um, uh, type of video. Uh, with that, uh, again, we can, we can close the session here. Uh, thank you, Geoffrey. Thank you to the attendees. And we hope to see you in our next uh, thought leadership event. Bye. Bye for now.